you do not have that handout that was handed out before worship, please raise your hand and we will get you a copy of that. It will go along with the lesson this morning. Last week we started a study of Daniel chapter 7. The last two sermons that we had last week dealt with the entire chapter of Daniel 7, predicting the world empires that would come from the Babylonian period all the way up into the Roman period. It is foretold in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, and in Daniel chapter 7, that the Lord would set up a kingdom within the time period of the Roman Empire. And we saw how that this Roman Empire was depicted in this symbolic language as a dreadful and terrible beast. What we're going to see this morning is we're going to see how Revelation chapter 13 is speaking of the same thing that you find in Daniel chapter 7. And that should not surprise us because the Holy Spirit is the author of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see the fulfillment in Revelation chapter 13 of what Daniel foresaw by the prophetic Holy Spirit many, many centuries before the Roman Empire even existed. To understand the book of Revelation and all apocalyptic literature, you must understand that it is symbolic in nature. It uses signs and symbols to help convey messages. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, we're told that very thing. Revelation 1 and verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants, things which must shortly take place, that indicates it's not going to be things happening at the end of time, but something that's about to happen. And He sent, and notice, signified it by His angel to His servant John. Signified in the New King James Version indicates that it is given in signs. It's signified. Verse 2. John bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Then we have one of the several Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it For the time is near. Notice in verse 1, he said the events will shortly take place. Then in verse 3, he says the time is near. That gives us a time frame concerning what's going to happen within the book of Revelation. We understand and we know that it's not dealing primarily with things at the end of time. Oh, there are a few things that you find, like the judgment, Revelation chapter 20, and the eternal state of all humanity, whether in heaven or hell, Revelation 21 and 22. But much of what was going to happen was going to happen close to the period of the time that John wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So these events that you find in the book of Revelation are not things happening in the 21st century. And people like to take the imagery and the symbolism and say this is applying to America or to Britain or to Russia or to Iraq or Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with modern day Israel either. It's dealing with Satan using world empires against the people of God to persecute them and to go to war with them. And that's what we find as a fulfillment of what was foretold in Daniel chapter 7. Imagine a world, if you will, in which if you're going to go to Walmart, or Costco, or Kroger's, or Brookshire's, or wherever you might shop, out front, before you enter, there is a huge statue of an emperor the emperor of America. And before you go in and you do your shopping, you must burn incense in worship to that emperor. Or you can't go in and get groceries. 
Imagine, if you would, a world in which if you refuse to worship the image of the emperor, in the middle of the night, they will come into your house and they will arrest you and your children. And on pains of torture and death, you must give allegiance to the emperor or they will kill your children in front of you. Or they will take you and they will crucify you to death. Or they'll burn you at the stake. Or they will chop off your head, in some cases, when dealing with Roman citizens. Your property will be confiscated. Your property that you work so hard for will be taken from you by the government. There's not a thing you can do about it. There's no congressman that you can appeal to. There's no phone call you can make. 911 is in bed with the emperor. The police force. The army, the navy. They're loyal to the emperor. There's not a thing you can do. What I've just described to you is the world of the Roman Empire. In which the church had to exist. The church had to survive that. The book of Revelation was written to show that this persecution would be intense. This persecution would be there. This persecution would come upon the people of God. But God's people can be victorious over it. And it doesn't matter what comes up against the people of God. God's people, if they remain loyal to Jesus Christ, if they overcome Satan, self, and sin... They can come over and they can live with God for all eternity. Revelation chapter 13. Turn in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 13. After John gives a message to the seven churches of Christ in Asia Minor, after the throne room of God is shown in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, and much imagery is shown in that uh, section of Scripture, After Revelation chapter 12 that steps back and shows us who's behind all this opposition. The one who's behind all this opposition to God and His people is that great dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Revelation 12 tells us that. He's been trying to destroy the efforts of God ever since Jesus came into the world. That's what's depicted in the imagery of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 13, which corresponds to Daniel chapter 7, is going to show us that the devil is going to use two henchmen to carry out his war against the saints. Revelation 13 in verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. John is seeing this imagery. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Doesn't that remind you of Daniel? Daniel chapter 7. This beast having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Now notice this creature. Verse 2. He's a composite creature. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. You see the composite imagery? What does it correspond to? Daniel chapter 7. All of those images of those different creatures that represented the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire. In so many ways, the Roman Empire was a composite of the previous empires that came before it. And as we see here, it is depicting Rome as this dreadful and terrible beast that you find in Daniel chapter 7. Who's behind this empire? The dragon. Who's that? Revelation chapter 12. That's Satan. The devil. He is behind the power because that empire chose to follow him and his wicked ways. 
You know, God's responsible for the rise and fall of empires. And empires and nations have a choice. Are we going to do things God's way? Are we going to follow Him? Or are we going to fall in league with the devil? Well, the Roman Empire decided to fall in league with the devil and do his bidding. Therefore, the dragon gave the Roman Empire its power, its throne, and great authority. Look at verse 3, Revelation 13, 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Most likely this is referring to the death of Nero, who was the first Roman emperor to really push persecution against the Christians. Nero had all kinds of problems. And all these, you study these emperors, they were very wicked, very ungodly. They would kill their own relatives. A lot of these Roman emperors would commit suicide or they would kill their servants or kill a rival. Very immoral people. And Nero was very wicked and he, it is alleged, set fire to Rome and then he blamed the Christians and so Christians were persecuted under his reign. But then he died and that persecution kind of waned for a little bit. But then Domitian came along, another emperor towards the end of the first century. And he took up the mantle of persecuting God's people. Verse 4. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and worshipped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the beast of the sea is this Roman empire. Roman empire. Who is like the Roman Empire? Who can go to war against him? Look at verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. This corresponds to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Speaking blasphemous things. What was Domitian saying? What were the other emperors saying as well? I am a God. You must worship me. You must bow down to me. My image is going to be set up all over the empire. And you must bow down to it. Or you cannot do commerce. You cannot have your freedom. Look at verse 6. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So here you have the Roman emperors blaspheming God to speak against God is to blaspheme. They blasphemed His name, that is His authority. They blasphemed His tabernacle. I believe that's referring to the church. That's where God dwells. They were fighting against the church. They blasphemed those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to Him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Again, Daniel chapter 7 said that would happen with this dreadful and terrible beast. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Those who aren't dedicated, committed Christians are going to give in and they're going to worship the emperor. They're going to give in. They're going to bow. But those whose names are in the book of life, those who are devoted and dedicated Christians, who are loyal to the Lamb who was slain, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego of old, they're not going to bow. Daniel chapter 3. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In other words, what goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. We'll have more to say about that just a little bit later on. So this first beast, to fill in the first blank of your sheet, the beast from the sea is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. It corresponds to that dreadful and terrible beast that you find in Daniel chapter 7 that Daniel predicted. But then the devil has a second henchman, another beast. But this beast is coming up out of the earth. It's coming up out of the earth. Revelation 13 and verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Again, who's behind this? Satan. 
This beast of the earth or from the earth is emperor worship. The religion of the emperor cult within the Roman Empire. This beast coming from the earth is also known as the false prophet. He's called that in Revelation 16 and verse 13, Revelation 19 and verse 20, and Revelation 20 and verse 10. I'll give you those scriptures again. Revelation 16 and verse 13, Revelation 19 and verse 20, and Revelation 20 and verse 10. This beast here of verse 11 is called the false prophet. Why? It's representing false religion within the Roman Empire. Now, let's go further and see what this second henchman is going to do. Verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast. In other words, this is a politically motivated religion of the Roman Empire. In his presence, verse 12, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this emperor worship cult within the Roman Empire was setting up these shrines to the emperor all over the Roman Empire. And everyone in those provinces and those places of the Roman Empire had to bow down and worship that image. And they were responsible for making sure that happened. And when people didn't, that's when they were persecuted. He performs these false signs and wonders, tricks, magic tricks, to trick people, to convince them. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He's tricking people. He's a charlatan. Verse 14, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should be both, both, uh, should both speak and to cause as many as would not worship the image to be killed. You're not going to worship the emperor? You're going to die. You're going to die. What about freedom of religion? No such thing. Don't have those freedoms back then. Therefore, you either submitted or you died. Look at verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. Now, this is not a literal mark. This is talking about being designated as those who identify with emperor worship. If you worship the emperor, what you would get was a certificate. That certificate was the mark that identified, you've got your papers, you, you, you did worship the emperor. Therefore, you're good. You can go into the marketplace and you can do business because you, before you entered in, you worshiped the emperor and you got your papers to prove it. Your certified certificate of emperor worship. They receive that mark. Verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is written, it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now so much has been made of this and it's very simple. It's not complicated. Seven is a number of perfection and symbolism. Seven means absolute perfection. It's a number that designates that which is perfect. Six falls short of perfection. And to say 666 means that this is a three times loser. This person wants to be a god. But now he is going to find out that he is going to be the loser. He wants so much to be seven. But he's just six, six, six. This has nothing to do with barcodes. This has nothing to do with computer chips. This has nothing to do with the internet. This is dealing with things that happened within the first centuries of the early church. And those who would not bow to that image, would not identify with that, with that image, would not receive those certified papers proving 
that they had worshipped the emperor, they would be persecuted, they would be killed. Revelation 2 and verse 10, what did Jesus say? He said, some of you will be thrown into prison for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. Be faithful into death. And I will give you a crown of life. You're going to have to suffer for me, and you're going to have to die for me, Jesus said. But Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, I've already done that for you. Did he not already suffer and die for us? Should we not be willing to suffer and die for him if he already suffered and died for us and conquered death by his resurrection? So we see here these powerful henchmen, these powerful allies to Satan that are going to be persecuting the church, making war with the saints, as Daniel chapter 7 said would happen. Daniel 7 and verse 11 says of these emperors, he says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words, the blasphemous words, which the horn was speaking, talking about the emperors. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Other words, Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 already saw the fall of the Roman Empire. And what John is doing as he writes under the same Holy Spirit is reminding them what Daniel saw is going to happen. You're going through it now, Christians. But it's going to happen. This empire... This beast and false prophet, they will reap what they have sown. What does Paul tell us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. An empire that sows to the flesh, persecutes God's people, will fall ultimately we see that you look on your sheet you look at number two the beast from the earth that's emperor worship but look at the scripture revelation 19 verses 19 through 20 as powerful as these beasts were these forces were against the saints the saints who are spiritually fighting against the forces of darkness not physically they're engaged in spiritual warfare Ephesians chapter 6. Everything that Satan could throw against them. Look at Revelation 19, verses 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That's talking about Christ. Then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet. That would be the beast from the earth who worked signs in His presence, by which He deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image, talking about idolatry. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. They're in hell. They will be in hell for all eternity. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, talking about the end of time ultimately. And anyone, anyone that goes up, whether it be the Roman Empire or any empire, any nation, any society that goes up against the people of God. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Eternal punishment all those who oppose God and his people will lose will lose ultimately this should encourage us this should thrill us this should motivate us to live for God each and every day and to get as many people in this world out of that condition because this is their end Revelation 20 and verse 10 is the end of your friends and your relatives and your co-workers and your neighbors who are not Christians they're going to hell and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and they will miss the glories of heaven Revelation 21 and 22 
Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The message that we carry with us in the 21st century is this. No matter what beast comes against us, you might have personal beasts coming against you. You might have beasts coming against you in various forms. Whatever it might be, we will be victorious, though we may have to endure for a little while. We might have to endure for a little while. Jesus endured. We can too if we remain close to Him. Walk with Him every day. Talk to the Father through Him every day. Placing our burdens upon God because He cares for us. I want to close this study seeing that the, the enemy, as great and as fearsome and as terrible and as dreadful as it is, is going to be defeated. The words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, are apropos. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with us also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank God for the victory we have in Christ. The question is, are you in Christ? Confess your faith in Christ And repent and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And these promises are yours. And whatever you face, whatever beast it might be, whatever the church must face in the future. You know, if the world stands, the America of today in 50 years may be totally gone. And we may be facing a persecuting government. If Islam had its way, Sharia law would be imposed on us right now if we did not submit to Islam and that false religion. In many places of the world it is, and Christians are being persecuted as a result of that false religion. Be faithful into death, and I will give you a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. If you are a Christian, but you're not living as you should, you're falling away, we urge you to repent and come back. And God will forgive. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and we sing.